Nothing brings home the importance of typography like an old Dick and Jane book, or really any book from which we or our children learn to read, because it represents type at its essence. It must be easy to read. Each character must be easily understood as the letter, punctuation mark, or number that it's meant to be. The spacing between the letters mustn't be too close or too far apart, and then there must be sufficient word spacing so that one word doesn't run right into the next. The typeface really doesn't matter at all to the person learning to read. What they care about is how quickly and easily they can distinguish the characters. They really need to feel comfortable with how the letters and the words look. Most of us in the Western world learn to read with a serif typeface. That's what this typeface is here. Serifs are the little feet on the bottoms of the primary stems of the letters. To this day, most of us are still more comfortable reading serif typefaces, at least for smaller paragraph text. Anyway. So when it comes to visual communication, function must always trump form. That's a problem to me. Fortunately, it will not be often, if ever, that we need to communicate to people who are learning to read, as that would greatly limit our options and our use of type. Because the beautiful thing is that even though type needs to be easily read, type characters do have form. And the form or design of those characters is not only beautiful, but has the ability to greatly enhance how our message is delivered and perceived. As you look at this type design, you'll see that I've definitely bent the rules a bit. Why is this okay? Because I'm dealing with a smart, educated audience who has the ability to understand more complex ideas. That's you. Movie. You are also visually sophisticated by virtue of all the information to which you've been exposed and absorbed over your lifetime. And because this is display type, meaning this type is meant to be seen at large size and have very few words. Think of a headline at the top of an ad as opposed to the small paragraph text at the bottom. These are all good reasons why I can push the boundaries a bit with this design. But the key is always to push type in a way that will give the message greater impact and clarity, but won't take away from the viewer's ability to easily absorb the content. So here it is in a nutshell. Display type attracts. Text type explains. Display type grabs the viewer's attention, which is no easy task in the midst of the visual clutter we are exposed to every day. But if you can stop the viewer, and deliver them a quick, compelling message. Then the text type can close the deal. Oh, baby. Because display and text type perform very different functions, I've broken the subject of type into two different videos. This video will cover the general concepts and terms of typography as a whole, and then I'll discuss display type specifically. The second video, which will come later in the semester, will discuss text type and build upon what you've learned from this video and the first project. Let's begin by talking about some big picture stuff. Then I'll move in for some close-ups on specific concepts and terms. Type classifications allow us to categorize, subcategorize, and sub-subcategorize typefaces. This is very important in these digital times as there are hundreds of thousands of fonts from which to choose. Classifications allow us to more easily hone in on the best type choice for a particular project without spending days scrolling through every imaginable possibility. Shown here are four primary classifications of type. I won't discuss the subclassifications as that's getting a little too detailed for this beginning lecture. But know this, some of you will discover you really love type and you'll learn these subcategories and more. That is a slippery slope, my friend as subclassifications are the gateway to type nerdism. <gasps> Beware. Let's start with the oldest classification, serif. Now these three typefaces, Georgia, Dido, and Rockwell, I think you'll agree are very different from each other, but they do have one thing in common, the little feet at the end of the strokes and stems of each character. These little feet are serifs. Which leads us to sans serif, the key here is understanding what sans means. Any guesses? Here's a clue. It's French. <laughs> no help? Okay, here's some context. Serif typefaces were around a long time before sans serif came along, which was round about the Industrial Revolution, when everything became mechanized, motorized, and assembly lined. The world changed forever. Traditions were lost, and so were livelihoods. 
In the midst of this upheaval, many people didn't like this new sans serif type. Like machines, it was cold and lacking in humanity. Type had lost something. Well, that was a really good hint. Okay, so tell me, what does sans mean? Duh. Oh, good grief. Without people, sans means without. Sans serif is type without serifs. What? Ever. Now, script typefaces have become a gigantic category of fonts, which is funny, because not too terribly long ago, script fonts was the smallest category of them all, one which contained almost nothing but formal calligraphy typefaces. But today, a script font can be anything which is based on hand-drawn characters. So that can be formal calligraphy, but it can also be expressive calligraphy or sign painting where a brush has been used, or stylized letter forms completely created on the computer. Heck, even your handwriting can be a font these days. Finally, we get to decorative, which is another huge category as it encompasses everything which doesn't easily fit into one of the traditional classifications. This category has some really fun choices, but it comes with a caveat. Less is more, which is something we'll talk more about later in the video and then throughout the semester. Now, typeface families come into play more if you're working with lots of copy. For instance, a brochure or editorial layout where you have headlines, subheads, body copy, captions, pull quotes, page numbers, etc which is why we'll talk about this subject in greater detail in type video number two, which discusses text type. But that said, I want you to know a bit about type families now. A type family is a collection of fonts which are based on the same typeface design, but have different weights, widths, and slants. So what does that mean? I don't know. Well, if you look at these showings of the fonts I've used in this video, you can probably start to figure it out. Weight means the thickness of the strokes in a character. For instance, Museo Sans 100 has a very thin stroke weight, but if you look down at Museo Sans 900, obviously that's a very heavier thick weight. Now width has to do with how wide the characters are. For instance, the characters in Museo Sans are wider than they are in Museo Sans Condensed. And typefaces can be ultra condensed or extra wide and everything in between. Slant is all about the angle of italic. So if you look at the small Georgia family, you'll note that each weight has a regular and an italic version. Okay, so here's another example, but this is a little bit different. This is a typeface named Acumen, and it's a variable font. This represents what is most likely the future of digital type. So Acumen is amazing because it is a family, but you have the ability to control exactly who the members are of that family and then change them at will. How nice would that be? <laughs> and here's the best part. You can try it yourself. So go into Illustrator, go into InDesign, pull up one of these variable fonts and give it a crack. You know, make the typeface weight heavier, make the characters wider, and make the slant be whatever you want it to be. This is cool stuff. Woof. You may be saying to yourself, why? Why did I take this class? Well, that's simple. You have to. Another reason you might be saying it is that it's written on the screen here. Why is it written on the screen? Well, that's a darn fine question. It's there so I can share with you some type components and terms that will help you work with and communicate about type. The first term is baseline, which is the optical line upon which all the characters in a typeface sit. The key word here is optical. Obviously, the line is not really there. You'll note that certain characters look like they're sitting on this baseline, but actually descend just a little bit below it. Certain characters, which are round or have diagonal strokes, if sitting right on the baseline, will look like they're floating a little bit higher than the flat-bottomed letters. It's a bit of an optical illusion for which type designers need to adjust. Next up is cap height, which, wait for it, is the height of a capital letter. No this way! height is really important relative to the next term. X height is the height of a lowercase x in a type design. The relative difference between the cap height and the x height can make a tremendous impact on the look and readability of a typeface. 
A higher X height generally looks more contemporary and enhances readability. The last two terms also relate to the design and readability of a typeface. A descender is the part of a character that descends below the baseline, and the ascender is the part of a lowercase character that ascends above the X height line. The length of ascenders and descenders can vary greatly from typeface to typeface. In fact, notice how different the relationships are between the two typefaces I've used in this video. The more you work with type, the better you will understand relationships. Relationships like one aspect of a character to another part. For instance, cap height to X height. And the relationship of one character to another, like a capital W and a lowercase o. You'll even start to have opinions on the best distance to have between lines of text. When it comes to using type well, there is nothing more important than relationships like these. Yes, dear. Now, some of these will be taken care of by the type designer, but many relationships you get to take charge of. And this falls under the heading of spacing. Letter spacing, word spacing, and line spacing. Let's start with word spacing. Let's see if you can figure out this one on your own. Word spacing is... Correct! The space between words. Well done! This is not something you will need to adjust very often, as this falls under the type designer's purview. But occasionally, you will. Next up is letter spacing. Ah, but this is not as simple as word spacing, because there are two kinds of letter spacing. Oh, man. The first we'll talk about is tracking. Tracking is the overall letter spacing in a block of type. This can be a word, line, paragraph, column, or entire page of text. Normal tracking is what the type designer defines as the best overall spacing for their typeface. If you don't change the track setting for a block of type, you will get normal tracking. But you can control this if you don't like how the type designer spaced the font, if you have a specific aesthetic that you're going for, or most importantly, if you need to help the readability in a certain use or circumstance. Tight tracking means that you've made the overall letter spacing closer. Open or loose tracking means that you've added more space between the characters. Kerning is the other kind of letter spacing. Kerning is the space between two specific characters. For instance, a capital K and a lowercase e. The type designer defines a relationship between every character in a typeface and every other character. The average typeface has about 250 characters, so there are thousands and thousands of spacing relationships that the type designer has defined within a particular font. But you may still need to adjust the kerning between two characters once in a while. Why? Because many typefaces are designed to be used as text type and not at large display sizes. Spacing in text type, by necessity, needs to be more open for readability. So when you enlarge a text font to use as a headline, often the spacing isn't right. This is when you'll need to tighten the tracking a bit and adjust the kerning between certain characters. Fortunately, adjusting kerning is very easy to do in Adobe Illustrator and InDesign. Finally, let's talk about line spacing or letting. Line spacing is the term most often used today, but the traditional and, in my opinion, correct term right. is letting. So why is it called letting? You have 10 seconds to give me your answer. Oh, I'm sorry, your time is up. In the old days, going back to Gutenberg, when type was handset, if the typesetters wanted to add more space between lines, guess what they would use? Strips of lead. God, I love type history. So leading is the space between lines, measured from baseline to baseline. There are some guidelines for text type leading, which I'll cover in the next type video, but there are no set rules for the best leading amount to use for display type. But never just blindly accept the Adobe default letting. Set it to the amount that you think is best for impact and readability. Okay, now we're getting to the fun part. Actually choosing fonts that you want to use. Fonts that will increase the impact of your message. 
But before we get to that, I think we all know that there's an elephant in the room. Let's not pretend, let's not be polite, let's just call it what it is. This is one but ugly type design. Oh my! Do you recall that earlier I said less is more? Well, this certainly isn't less. It is more, and it is crap. Don't ever do this, unless you have a very good reason, like I did here. But remember, I'm the teacher, I'm a professional, you could get hurt, you could get a bad grade. So here we go, the fun part. I'm going to show you three different words. The first one here is rugged. I'm sure some of you read this as rugged, but that's not a word. This is rugged as in tough. Those of you who have me for class will probably agree that this is a word that well describes me. <laughs> but I digress. I'm going to show you four typefaces for each of the three words, and I want you to tell me which is the best font choice for that word. Don't be shy, shout it out. So which font is the best choice for rugged? Excellent! Ding, ding, ding! Correct! Okay, now for the second word that describes me. Sophisticated. Correct again! You are on a roll, my friend. And then finally, the word the wife uses to describe my legs. Flamingo. Whoa! What's up with that? Why did we have such universal agreement on the first two words and then flamingo disintegrates into chaos? You probably know why that is. The first two words have a very universal meaning. We all have a very similar idea of what rugged and sophisticated should look like. But flamingo? Flamingo needs context. Is it a $25 drink in a fancy Manhattan piano bar? Is it a sign at the San Diego Zoo? Is it a Cuban restaurant in Miami? Or a new line of pink kid shoes sold at Target? This is what you'll bring to the party. Your point of view, your visual sensibilities, and your knowledge of who the audience is, the demographic, the marketplace, and your understanding of what will grab their attention, then pull them into your message. Good type selection is critical to your success as a visual communicator. There are all kinds of do's and don'ts relative to different aspects of visual communication, whether it's layout, color, or typography. But you've probably heard that every rule is meant to be broken. And that certainly is true, especially if you're trying to grab attention and communicate in a unique way. But you have to know what you're doing. To break the rules, you have to understand them. Have you ever seen any of Picasso's early drawings? They look like they're straight from the Renaissance. So he very well understood form, light, and shadow before he started breaking the rules that they followed. And so should you. Here are 12 things you should do and not do with type. The first do and don't are the most important. Do make sure your type is readable because if you don't, you fail. Do keep your type solution simple. When you're learning a program like Adobe Illustrator, you're gonna be tempted to do all kinds of whiz bang stuff when the best solution is probably going to be much simpler. Don't use too many fonts. One or two will almost always suffice. Don't use special effects without very good reason, as they can distract the viewer from your message. Don't put an outline on your type for the same reason. My favorite quote along these lines is, each addition subtracts. In other words, if an element doesn't add meaning to your communication, then it becomes a distraction from your communication. Do hold the shift key when manually resizing type. Don't distort type. Do use smart quotes. Otherwise, you'll look dumb. Don't blindly accept the default type settings in Illustrator and InDesign. 
do adjust tracking, kerning, and leading to facilitate easy readability. Do make sure there is plenty of contrast between your type and the background. Don't put type over a complicated background. And finally, do be a communicator. Don't be a decorator. In closing, Thank God. here is my challenge to you. Look around. Type is everywhere. But if you don't look, you won't see it. When you see a type solution you like, take a picture of it or download it. Create a digital inspiration folder that you can refer to for ideas. The downside to doing this, of course, is that it will turn you into a type snob. You'll start judging every piece of type you see. You'll get nauseous when you run across Comic Sans or Papyrus. Actually, there's nothing wrong with Comic Sans or Papyrus. They are both perfectly appropriate fonts that are often used inappropriately. And ultimately, that's what this video has been all about, keeping you from being inappropriate.